Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, we will be talking about using AWS migration refactor services in a multi-account environment. And what are the recommended practices associated with that? My name is Mani Sejadpur. I lead a specialist team at AWS, and I'm going to be joined by Alan Delucia in a couple of minutes, who will dive deep <coughs> into the details. So at a high level, uh, this is kind of what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about refactoring while serving our customers, talk about refactoring services, uh, or refactoring applications within AWS, talk about AWS Migration Hub refactor spaces, and then talk about how to do that in a multi-account environment, right? And what is the account strategy or ways to think about doing microservices with a, a multi-account environment, and what are the things you want to take into consideration, how you want to think about it, and a, a demo associated with how to do that, leveraging AWS Control Tower, and also how to do that with AWS Migration Hub refactor services, which we just launched in preview. So let's start with an example. We're going to use a unicorn shop example uh, throughout the session. Um, the demo will also be on a unicorn shop. I, I promised my daughters I'll talk about unicorns, so I'm keeping my promise here and, and going through that example. So I'm going to start with the store example and then associate it to an application and talk about how you would kind of start refactoring or remodeling your store and upgrading it um, from an from <clears throat> application point of view. So at a high level, I have a store. I sell different kinds of unicorn toys. I have stuffed uh, unicorn toys. I have, uh, let's say, water bottles with unicorns on it and a bunch of different uh, things, that toys or, or products that I'm putting on my shelves. So in my store, I have a front door. People come in through there. I have a bunch of shelves that I've set up. I have a cashier and I have a stocking area. And you know, I'm serving customers and I'm the only one doing all this. So I start my store and I'm doing everything there. I'm putting things on the shelves. I'm filling up the inventory. I'm checking people uh, out as, as they want to purchase items within my store. So now I got my store going. I get more and more customers coming to my store, and I want to enhance my customer experience. Um, so more, cu more customers are coming in. I need to start thinking about expanding my store or being able to handle more traffic um, with, with my customers, right? <clears throat> so how do I expand my store? How do I handle more traffic, right? How do I continue to enhance the customer experience for my customers same kind of methodology applies to applications and how you want to think about you know, what you do with your application. So here's the kind of things I want to think about while I'm remodeling my store or I'm remodeling or, or refactoring my application. I want to keep my business open. I want to have and create continuous customer value for my customers. Uh, I want to make sure that the customer experience not only stays the same as I'm getting more and more customers to my environment, but I'm also making it better and better um, as I progress and as I get more customers, right? So what do I have to do uh, to ensure that, right? I want to make sure my store stays open, right? So I don't have any downtime. I don't reduce the customer experience. I don't get low reviews online. Uh, and I want to continue building my store. So I want to start remodeling the store um, while I'm also serving my customers. So same kind of concept applies to applications. And I have to start thinking about what are the different roles I'm going to have I'm going to separate things by domain or by function or capabilities within my application, or think of it as my store. So here's my store. I have a front door, but now this is what I want to remodel to. I have more shelves. I have more products. Uh, and then I have more cashiers. And I'm going to have a larger uh, stocking area to be able to support more and more customers within my environment. So how do I go about doing this without reducing the customer experience, but actually enhancing my customer experience and when I say customer experience, it could be any kind of consumer of my application or anyone who's coming to them into my store. So I will have people who come in and look at the shelves. Some of them will make purchases. And then I have, let's say in this example, I'm going to have two cashiers. So think of this. I have specific people who are cashiers. I have specific people who are, uh, who are in uh, increasing the stocking or making sure the inventory is good. And I have people who are shelving things. And I have a front door. And I don't want to change my environment. I want to kind of keep everything running while I'm also adding more and more functions. So I'm going to have specific roles within my environment. So I have a, let's say I used to do everything, but now I want to hire cashiers and I have them do specific functions uh, within that environment, which is to be able to have, uh, meet my customers and transact or do an e-commerce transaction <clears throat> if it's applying to an application. So let's look at it from a goal, like what's my goal with, with my store, which also applies to applications as well, right? So I want to expand my store. I want to add a new decor. I want to have folks who are specific to, let's say, being able to do to, to cashiers, or I want to have the delivery service, or, or have more inventory folks. From a goal perspective, 
my goal is to enhance the customer experience. So if I have more customers coming in, some of them know exactly what they want to purchase, they can come straight to the cashier and purchase exactly what they're specifically looking for, or they can browse more products as I'm bringing more products into the store so they have more options available to my, to my uh, customers. So from an application point of view, I'm going to kind of bounce between that and the store example. Uh, I want to make sure that I map my technology. Let's say I'm buying a new uh, 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 point of sale system to, to my business functions that I have within my environment, right? So I have folks who are specifically focusing on a given function within that environment. How do I do that? What are the challenges I face with that? The same kind of challenges apply to, to applications. How do I do this? How do I transition this into separate functions without impacting the customer experience, right? How do I transition transparently? How do I minimize my risk to my business? So I want to make sure the front door is open, people are coming in, they're still having the same experience, uh, and there's no operational uh, impact to my store. So let's map the different functions here to, for example, how it would look like within an application. I have an application endpoint. The endpoint is where consumers come. Now I used a, customer, a store example, so it could be a customer coming in. It could be another application making a request in. It's just a consumer endpoint for, for the application. And different customers are coming to that application endpoint and being able to make purchases from there. So the area I have with my shelves, which I'm expanding, think of that as my catalog, where I have all of my different offerings there. Uh, and different uh, you know, customers can come in and browse. Not necessarily all of them will make a transaction with me, right? Not necessarily all of them will buy. But a lot of them will come in and browse the different kind of products that I have in there and say the different kind of uh, unicorn stuffed toys that I'm offering there, right? And then some of them will start transacting and buying things in my environment, which is what I'll do with, with the commerce transaction. Think of it as a commerce piece. And last but not least is my inventory or how I'm looking at my inventory within my environment. So how does this map or what do I think about this from, a, <clears throat> from an application point of view and what are the different things I could do with my store? So the first thing I could do with my store is I could either expand my store so I can constantly remodel and, and refresh and add more things, just kind of like the previous example I showed you, or I could start expanding my store and buying stores next to it or having different functions in different stores. So let's say I was selling a lot of water bottles with unicorns on it, I want to have another store, I buy the next store next to me and they just make them specially focused on that. If I want to translate that to an application, let's say I have a new mobile payment application, I can create a net new application or a net new store that just does that or a net new microservice that does that, or I could start gradually changing things within my existing store and expanding my store so I, can ex so I can serve my customers. So going back to the previous slide real quick, I have two cashiers. I can set up one new cashier and have customers coming into the new cashier while I'm remodeling the rest of the store. And think of it the same way with, with applications as well. So this is how we're thinking about refactoring patterns and refactoring applications. And we're gonna start diving deeper into like the specifics of it from an application point of view. So there's two methods associated with that. One is to refactor incrementally with the strangler fig model. So I have an application. I want to be able to take pieces of that application and turn those into microservices. I have a monolith. I want to break it up into different microservices based on the functions that I have. So let's say I have one store application, one monolith. Everyone's coming in. They have the catalog. They have uh, the transaction, the inventory. Everything's there. Now I want to separate out and pull apart the commerce piece and redo the commerce piece by myself, so customers who come to my new application have a new experience, and I'm expanding that commerce application experience. So I can redirect slash commerce to a net new experience for my customers, right? And as I do that, I can turn off the old code that I have in that space that does specifically commerce in my monolith application. The other method around it is what we call leave and layer, right? So I would be able to build net new functionality leave the monolith or my application as is, but build net new functionality there, right? So I use the example of a mobile payment application. I would have that as a separate application. It was kind of like having a second store, right? It's opening a next store next to it and being able to uh, traffic or, or send customers specifically to that endpoint. So both methods work, uh, and, and both methods are there, and we can talk about both of them uh, today. Specifically, we're gonna spend a lot of time on Strangler Fig and diving deeper into that. Um, I kind of wanna go over some definitions as we go through this, so think of microservices as independently deployable services modeled around the larger business domain. So in my previous example, think of commerce 
I'm changing things in my commerce. It doesn't really necessarily impact catalog directly. Um, they're independently deployable. I can upgrade it continuously, and I have customers coming directly, let's say, to my cashier service and buying things and checking it out, right? I can independently deploy it. I can upgrade it um, as I'm building net new things within my environment. A monolith is an application where all the components are deployed together. So think of it as all of the application components that I had mentioned before, all of those components are tied together. So every time I deploy it, I am, I'm actually putting my entire application at risk because everything is dependent on each other. In the microservices infrastructure, all the different components talk to each other or they can talk to each other via the network. So I can do upgrades continuously to a specific component within my environment as I'm building uh, out my environment. So why would I refactor? And why would I look at um, refactoring different services within that environment? So one simple, straight up, like uh, different examples for it is to reduce the deployment brass radius. So if I'm making changes to commerce, it won't impact catalog. It won't impact inventory. It won't impact the endpoint. Customers can still come in. I can still test it out separately and be able to deploy it, which leads me and gives me the ability to have functional autonomy. So I have a team that's specifically spending their time on commerce. It's kind of like having cashiers who just spend their time on commerce. And let's extend that out. Let's say my commerce application needs to be PCI compliant because I'm taking credit card uh, information in from customers and I need to go through specific compliance requirements so I can separate that out and see, keep that as a separate functional element. Right? And I can continuously, let's say I need to continuously update my commerce platform or my commerce capability. I'll be able to continuously update that and be able to scale that out if I'm getting a lot of traffic associated with that and folks are making purchases associated with it, right? So this kind of drives or allows you to have domain-driven design and be able to separate functions out. Now, take that example that I just showed with the store and apply it to dozens of applications, hundreds of applications, thousands of applications. How do I standardize that process? How do I make it easier for developers to be able to start refactoring my monoliths into specific microservices and being able to have them uh, be able to do different functions and break that out. So we just launched yesterday AWS Migration Hub Refactor Spaces in Preview, which allows you to create an a refactor environment that reduces the time to, to be able to, or it, reduces, it standardizes the ability to create um, microservices with that environment and reduces your time to set up that refactor environment. So think of it as I take away all the infrastructure components that I would have a developer set up, I would make that a repeatable, easy, standardized approach. And it allows you to do everything within a unified environment. And it shields the developers and your end users, which are your customers, whoever is consuming your application, from having to see the infrastructure changes. It's kind of like the front door of the store. Everyone still has the same customer experience, but they don't know I'm changing my inventory, or I'm updating my commerce uh, uh, system, or my cashier system with no problems, right? Uh, and they're having the same exact experience they had before. And how we do that is we reroute traffic from old uh, to the new um, accounts in the multi-account structure, which we'll dive into, or uh, tr send the old code or, or the customer experience. The default goes to the monolith. And as I'm building net new or I'm peeling off using Strangler Fig, I'm peeling off pieces of that component. They're going to the net new experience as well. So if I have slash commerce going to a net new experience, that'll be in a different account. And all the routing will be done uh, through refactor spaces, making it easier for our customers. So at a high level, this is kind of what it looks like. I have customers or end users or consumers of my API or application. They want to hit my application. Uh, I'm just using a browser as an example here. Um, they're hitting the endpoint, and then they're going to hit the refactor services environment, the, the refactor spaces environment, sorry. In this example, and as we continue through this demo, we're going to, uh, through this presentation and the demo, we're going to focus on how to do this in a multi-account environment. So we're using three accounts here. The box on the left-hand side or in the middle is the refactor spaces environment account. And then you have a new experience or where I'm building my net new microservices experiences on the upper right-hand side. And on the bottom right-hand side is my existing customer experience or my as-is code, if you will, or my current experience for my customers. So think of my customers coming in today. Whoever is the endpoint user of that, of that application, they'll go by default to the monolith. And as I am gradually peeling off pieces of it, of the application, turning those into microservices, I'll start running those new net new experiences in a different account. Let's say I'm using containers or Lambda, uh, and I'm routing them to a different endpoint. And the refactor spaces environment kind of helps you create that entire environment for you and allows you to give, have a unified view of your environment that you're setting up, everything you're seeing here. So how does it work? My customer comes to the endpoint. 
They're going to slash commerce. They're going to get redirected to my microservice. If they're coming to the default application, which is the home page, let's say, for, for my application, they'll go to the monolith instance. As I'm peeling pieces off and I'm building net new experiences there, I'm going to have them route from an application point of view to different microservices that I'm building within that environment. So what does my refactor spaces do under the hood? It, it, we're assuming you have this account set up, and we'll go through that. Uh, the accounts are set up. It will set up what you see in the middle. It'll set up an API gateway. It will set up for you um, a net network load balancer, and as well as a transit gateway. So all of this experience, all that infrastructure is preset through the service. The VPC, which is in the middle, in the middle account, which says refactor spaces environment, that VPC you create either when you're creating an environment or uh, you have it pre-created in an existing environment. That, we're calling that VPC a proxy VPC. It will be where your application is going to get routed to different endpoints. And then I have different accounts here. So I have my monolithic instances, which is my default experience. Think of that as slash. Let's say I have a website, example.com. It will go slash to, to, to the monolith instance if I set it up that way. And then I am going to re start rerouting customers to, for slash commerce to my microservices, uh, net new experience, or my net new code into the, the microservices account. So, this is just one specific instance, and you can kind of expand this out, and Alan, who will come on the stage in a couple of minutes, is going to talk about the specifics of how to do this in a multi-account environment, how do you do this with a different uh, SDLC environment. So I have different kind of environments, prod, pre-prod, uh, UAT, dev. How would I set this up for my application and be able to, to create that experience? So at a high level, let me just kind of go over all the specifics within that environment, and I'll go through how to set up a refactor spaces environment. So we have a definition of what an environment is. When you go into the console, you'll see this. That's the unified view of your environment that you're going to be refactoring applications in. It gives you the ability to, to have a unified view of networking, your applications, and your services. Think of services as your microservices or your monolith, uh, and you will set that up. You will also define an application. When you define an application, it will set up the infrastructure that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, and then think of it as a container of all your services. It has all your routes, and it creates that single point of entry with an API gateway where your application and consumers go to. From there, you would create services. So services are different microservices or the model service that you have to define within that environment. So it's the application business capabilities within that environment that you're creating, which have, re in, in it, which have unique endpoints for you to be able to route traffic to, as I showed in the previous slide. And last but not least is you set up routes. So you're going to set up routes in that environment that route, let's say, slash commerce to a particular account or a particular uh, endpoint uh, or slash, uh, um, let's say, inventory to a different endpoint as, I'm, as you're refactoring your application. So how do I set up this environment? And I'm looking at this from a multi-account perspective. So first and foremost, you need to have an account where you have your refactor spaces environment. And that's assumptions we're going to be making as we go through the demo. You create an account for your next new microservice subdomain or your microservice that you're going to be able to create. So that service, that microservice could be, it could be Lambda, it could be, con it could be containers, it could be even EC2. It depends on what you want to set up in your new environment. And we're assuming that you already have your application or your models uh, running on AWS. And you have to create a proxy VPC within the first account that I mentioned, the refactor spaces environment, um, to be able to route traffic uh, application traffic to the different accounts within your environment. So where are the specific steps you have to go through, and you see this through the demo as well, is you create an environment. When you create the environment, you have to specify a proxy VPC, or you can create it as you're creating that environment. So you'll be able to specify, you know, this is the VPC which I'm going to start routing from, uh, and then you have to determine whether your application is going to have a public and facing endpoint or not. So within the console it will be the regional or private. If it's regional, it has a public facing endpoint. If it's private, then you know your uh, application endpoint is private. Once you do that, you create an application. So when you create an application, and you'll see this in the demo, we're going to skip through some of it, but it actually sets up the underlying infrastructure associated with it. So it'll set up the API gateway, the network load balancer, the transit gateway associated with that application that you're defining. So think of this as, a, hey, I'm, this is how I'm defining my, my application, and I'm going to build services within that application to be able to, to separate things out um, within that environment. One important point, and you'll see this also, is you have to define a principle to share your application with, right? So those, if I go back two slides, these are going to be the, the specific accounts 
that I'm going to be sharing my environment with, right? So my principles, for example, here would be the two accounts on the right-hand side of this slide, and I'll show you another slide specific to that as well. So once I do that, I set up my application. Now I can start defining and creating services within my environment. So think of every service as you know, a microservice, or it could be your existing experience, which is your monolith. Um, and within your uh, service endpoint, you'll define the routing that goes between the different accounts in this example. So it'll be, by default, you'll have a slash, let's say a slash for your application. So everyone goes to example.com, we'll go to a specific account. And then as you're building new services, let's say slash commerce, you'll create a net new service and start routing customers directly to that. So this is kind of what it's gonna look like at a really high level. Uh, and Alan will show you the demo associated with it and go into the multi-account strategy and how to do this in multiple accounts. So you create the refactor environment, you identify the account, so you have to have the account uh, set up. Uh, you define your application proxy, which includes setting up your application, and then you define your services, and then you add routes to start routing things between uh, the different components um, that are in this slide. So I will have, let's say, slash commerce go to the upper, upper left uh, account, um, uh, and everything else by default go down to the monolith. And you'll see this um, as we demo it as well. So in summary, from a refactor spaces orchestration point of view, it kind of lets you standardize how you're gonna do your refactor environment. It'll allow you to make it simple and easier for you to be able to, uh, um, uh, for you to, be able to refactor your environment, uh, and it sets up an API gateway, transit gateway, and all the associated endpoints um, for you to be able to do that, and it allows you to share that application across multiple accounts, so allowing you to be able to route things across accounts, or you can share it with an organizational unit or an OU. So, kind of like, what are the benefits? Uh, let's say I want to go back and talk to my team. After reInvent from a CCOE and a security admin point of view, you can standardize how you're refactoring, which minimizes your security risk to your environment, and it makes less tickets um, for the from the application team to open routes to your environment. It makes it very simple for them to be able to set up a refactor environment, standardize it, make it easy for them to use, and you don't have to necessarily open up uh, new rules, have new tickets to create that process uh, based on feedback we're getting from customers. So there's no need to make new security groups. All that kind of complexity is abstracted away. It makes it easier for, for the application and development teams to be able to build things. From an application team perspective or a developer perspective, it's easier to build microservices now, right? A lot of that infrastructure pieces are standardized. It's easier for you to set up that environment, um, and it reduces time for going through infrastructure decisions as it helps you kind of build that baseline environment um, and reduce the number of security approvals that you need within that environment. So now for the second half of this uh, presentation, we're gonna go through the design patterns, how to go about this from a multi-account perspective, how to do, look into it from an SDLC perspective and use multiple accounts with that. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Alan, uh, who's gonna go through that. Here you go. All right, thank you. All right, so we start talking about multiple accounts. You know, let's start with the basic. You know, what is an AWS account? And at its most basic form, an AWS account is an access boundary and it's a financial boundary, right? So as you start to refactor applications, you want to think about how we want to group accounts together so that we can create an environment that's conducive for refactoring. You know, so we want to start with first some high level ideas. You know, first you're going to think about you know, things like resource isolation to handle you know, performance and capacity needs. You, know, you may have some environments that need to be pulled out you know, so they don't impact other environments and you want to keep those separate. Next we're going to talk about you know, security and compliance isolation. You know, Madi briefly talked about some PCI data that we may have with credit card you know, transaction processing and we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that in some subsequent slides, but that's a good pattern to also pull out you know, and keep separate of the rest of the environment. You know, then we want to talk about functional teams, right? This is where your, you know, your domain-driven uh, design is going to come in. You have different functions of the business, and you want to align them to different functions in your AWS account strategy, right? You may also have different teams in different places or different support organizations, and that's all going to factor in, right? And then we may also have something as simple as you know, cost, right? Bill back, charge back, where we want to have that granularity. You want to see you know, what we're consuming and where we're consuming it. So just kind of another idea of, of where you may want to split some of this up. And we'll get into that a bit deeper. And as you start getting into some of this design, you, know, you want to consider the business needs and the technology needs. And there's going to be some trade-offs in between. 
I mean, certainly there's going to be some accounts that may not fit the mold, and you need to break those out separately. But for the most part, you know, you want to go through a set of strategies to, to see where you want to bring these accounts together. And we're going to get into some of that in a minute. But let's say, you know, for example, you have a, an application that's you know, supported across multiple geographies, right, or multiple lines of business. You know, you may want to separate some of those environments so that each independent team, some might be a little bit faster than others in their release cycle, things of that nature, where they may want to have their own account so they're not impacting people in other environments that may have more, you know, of a static environment. So a couple things to keep in mind. All right, so when we start implementing accounts at scale, we want to automate and simplify as much as we can, right? And so to do this, you know, we want to, uh, I'm going to take you through the example and, and show you how we're going to do it, but take you back to the example of the unicorn store, you know, where we're trying to take a monolith and we're going to refactor it, so we have to make some assumptions, right? So first, this, the unicorn store is already on AWS. Maybe it was lifted and shifted, it's already in the environment, maybe you built it there native, and it has a public endpoint, right? That's our front door. And we're going to be using that front door, like Marty mentioned before, to route traffic through factory spaces into other environments as we build them. So as we start to build the individual microservice accounts, again, for this assumption, they're going to be landing in AWS. Like you may have a slightly different implementation, but for this, this, uh, you know, this presentation, this is what we're going to say. All right. So how do we do it? So we start out with an account, right? So we have our monolith that's in an account. We may have a few, right? We may have multiple accounts we're trying to refactor. We may have, you know, different, you know, SDLC level uh, monolith accounts. But it's already in an environment. It's got a support structure. You know, it has a team that supports it today. And they don't want to be impacted by, you know, development work, let's say we're doing on one of the microservice accounts. So it's its, its own entity. And as we want to get going, right, we want to build out the infrastructure that we're going to need uh, to refactor. So we're going to build an account that's specific for that specific application and that level of SDLC to route that traffic, right? And so this is your, your first uh, account that you're building uh, for refactor spaces. And then as you get moving, you know, parts, whether you're doing the leave and layer or you're doing the strangler fig, you're going to start building multiple microservices accounts, right? You're going to start chiseling them off. So if you went back, right, on day one, that traffic's still going to come through the front door, and it's going to go to the left to the original monolith account. And as you start moving some of those pieces, you know, more and more of that traffic is going to start going to the right to the individual accounts. All right, so we need to have a, an implementation approach because there's a bunch of pieces to this, right? So first we're going to talk about how we're going to split up, you know, the application into, into different, uh, different accounts, then how we're going to organize those accounts into OUs, and we're going to be using OUs to apply policy and guardrails, and then how we're going to simplify a lot of this by using AWS Control Tower. All right. So first, let's take the, the design of that application, right? So we talked about the unicorn store before. We're trying to expand it out. And the first things that we're going to start peeling off are three different domains, right? We've got commerce, which you think of commerce is like the shopping cart experience. We've got the catalog, you know, that's what people view, what you have. And then your inventory, which is your physical inventory, right? So you want to separate those three functions from the monolith. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to package them into OUs, which we're going to use to apply policy to, by domain. And then that is the high level, the higher level order OU. Beneath that, we're going to have SDLC. So for the simplicity of this slide, you know, we're showing prod and pre-prod, but you may have multiple, you know, dev test prod, UAT, things of that nature. We then want to go even deeper where we have other things that need to be peeled off. Like we talked about, you know, with credit card transactions that are under PCI compliance, right? We don't want to take that whole card experience and have to put that under the constraints of compliance when all we need to really isolate are the pieces that touch the credit card transactions themselves. We want to keep everything else in production, in the standard production environment, right? So that's your next level OU that you're going to apply policy to likely the PCI data is going to be more restrictive, but no need to, to bring that up to the other environments that don't need it. All right. So as you're starting to see, we're building a number of accounts, right? And we need to find a way to manage these accounts, right? And so how do we do that? So stepping back, you know, we've been talking a lot about refactoring, but stepping back, looking at the environment, kind of a picture of your, your total environment, we need to look at how we can use organizational units 
to apply policy as code, guardrails to the individual pieces of your environment. And we start talking about guardrails, you know, what is a guardrail? It's a simple rule that helps define compliance or security or operational functions that's going to be applied to a grouping of accounts, right? We don't want a one-to-one -one mapping that's too much to manage. We want to say where is there consistency in the environment, you know, as we talked about before, domain, SDLC, but zooming out, you know, you have a sandbox which likely needs, you know, less uh, of structure from a guardrail perspective you know, in other environments as well. And we start layering in things like the monolith accounts and the infrastructure accounts, which we'll bring all together in a moment. And then as we do that, you know, we want to simplify this and make it easier, make it streamlined, you know, one click. As a developer, you don't want to think about what's going on behind the scenes to start building these accounts. And that's where AWS Control Tower comes in, which, you know, is the easiest way to set up a managed landing zone in AWS. You know, one click, you can set up a landing zone, and we're going to get into what that entails in a moment. But once that's built and you have your landing zone in place, then it's going to start layering on foundational guardrails, either detective or preventative guardrails to your environment. It's going to help you automate uh, creating new accounts, because if we start bringing more microservices in, the need to build more accounts. Uh, is going to become repetitive. We want to standardize that environment, right? So we're going to use this, this automated framework to build more accounts and to apply, you know, some of your infrastructure products like the VPCs into the environment. And then we're going to pull it all together into a SSO. We're using AWS SSO. So every account that comes into Control Tower automatically gets built into AWS SSO. So you can log in immediately right after that account's built using, you know, some permission sets that were defined. And then finally, once we have all of these accounts in the control tower environment, you know, we're going to be watching a lot of these guardrails, you know, especially the detective-based guardrails, to see if anything is out of policy. And when it is, we want it to show up in a dashboard. We want to aggregate you know, a, lot of those, uh, a lot of those things that come up, and we can push them off to an SNS top. It can go to a, an ITSM front end or to a SIM or, or whatever you'd like. So looking at Control Tower, right, when you, you first click that button, say, hey, I want an AWS man, you know, managed landing zone, what does that mean? So we do a lot of things behind the scenes. You know, first and foremost, if you don't have AWS organizations, it's going to set that up for you. If you don't have SSO, same thing, it's going to set that up. But if you have them, then it's going to help configure them to this environment. It's also going to enable things like AWS Config and CloudTrail to everything that's in the environment and any new accounts that you create is going to automatically enable those functions you know, into that environment. It's also going to build two accounts. We've got the Log Archive account, which really hosts the S3 bucket where all those aggregated logs from trail and configure are going to go. And then we have our audit environment. And think of this as like the aggregation point you know, where a lot of our stack sense run, where you know, config is aggregating everything before it pushes it over into that environment. And then everything you see on, on the right is your environment. These are your provisioned accounts. We're trying to show some depth there, and we'll, we'll kind of expand on that in a moment. All right, so we talked about, you know, the domain-driven de design. We talked about the multi-account framework. We talked about, you know, how a control tower can help with that undifferentiated heavy lifting. And what we want to do now is kind of bring that all together to show kind of the formula for how you would want to manage this environment, this multi-account environment, to help you refactor. You know, and, and keep in mind, we've got multiple accounts here. You know, we kind of show this as, you know, one monolith, but really this is, you know, this could be n layers deep. You could be doing multiple at once. So what we've done here, you know, first and foremost, you know, looking at the OUs, right? We have, you know, with AWS organizations, the ability to go down five levels. We're taking our domain, you know, and first we started with, you know, commerce, inventory, catalog as domains, but now we're going to be layering on uh, infrastructure and the monolith accounts, right? And you have more. So remember from the previous slide, you've got Sandbox and you've got, you know, other environments as well that are now all underneath AWS organizations. And so we have commonality in those various OUs. Now, if you want to go down a level, that's where we start looking at SDLC, right? Dev, test, prod, and that's going to start building out because, again, now you have a particular, you know, application and you have different you know, different needs at a security standpoint at each OU as you go down. And then beneath that, we may have things like compliance, you know, PCI, non-PCI, things of that nature. So what we're going to do is then apply the guardrails at the OU level, and all of the accounts within that OU are going to benefit from it, right? They're going to inherit all of that policy. 
So going back to Control Tower, if you saw earlier this week, we announced the ability to, uh, to support nested OUs within Control Tower. And the cool thing about that is when we're looking at guardrails, we can apply some guardrails to the domain you know, that are common across you know, the various levels of SDLC. And then as we get more granular, as you kind of go down into that OU, we can be more restrictive, right? So your prod environments can have more guardrails than your you know, non-prod environment, and your PCI could have more than prod. And we'll show you some of that when we get into, we have two demos to show you, one with control tower and one with refactor spaces. We'll show you how we can be more restrictive as we go down into the OU structure. So bringing that all together, you know, this is our you know, slide on you know, what does the control tower landing zone look like, but now we're starting to bring those other pieces in, right? So these are all your monolith accounts, right? So anything that's gonna be refactored, they're gonna be controlled by control tower. We can build them out. You, know, you can migrate them into the environment, or if they pre-exist, you can bring them into AWS control tower. We're gonna start building that infrastructure on top, so we've got all of our refactor spaces accounts, and then of course we have our N number of microservices accounts that'll be built over time. So again, you know, as we start building up more and more accounts and managing them you know, through OUs and through guardrails, we start building this standardization, right? So all of the environments are built the same way, it's easier to support, you know, and there's less risk to, you know, to the original accounts and to the environment as a whole. All right, so I wanna switch over to some of the demos and what we wanna go through in the first demo, which is what Control Tower is, you know, how we're gonna align some of those OUs to what we showed you in the slides and how we're gonna apply you know, uh, guardrails to those environments and take you through a really quick uh, provisioning of a new account. All right, so this is, uh, this is the Control Tower for me to see this screen. So what we're trying to show here, let's see, is this going? Here we are. All right, so we go through, we see you know, the accounts that are under management and the number of guardrails that are enforced right now. We can check the state, you know, whether we're compliant or not. And we can show you know, all of the different OUs. This shows our nestings, we have our parent OUs, we have our child OUs, and whether or not we're within compliance and we're registered into Control Tower. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into one of these OUs, we're gonna pick the commerce OU, and we're gonna show some of the guardrails that were applied there. So again, this is like that nesting example to say, hey, you know, at the, at the top level, and in this case I actually use pre-prod as being more restrictive than prod, but we're gonna show that we've got all of our mandatory guardrails that are applied everywhere with Control Tower, and we have one, what we call strongly recommend, is one of our elective guardrails that were applied. You know, in this case it was for EBS on EC2. But then as we go down into the child, the second level OU, you know, we've got more guardrails applied. So in this case, we're gonna have three, which you'll see when it fully populates here. So there's three guardrails at pre-prod. And it's super easy to do. So if you wanna add a guardrail to an environment, it's as simple as going to that guardrail, enumerating it, seeing what it does, and then applying it to that environment. So super simple, select the OU that you want to enable it. Click the little radio button. And in the background it kicks off a stack set and voila, we're done. Super simple, now you see we've got one more guardrail applied there. All right, next I just wanna run through really quick an account factors. We're gonna enroll a new account just to show how easy this is to do. Couple questions, you know, basic stuff for AWS, you know, the owner email, the name, you know, SSO mail, if it is gonna be different, in this case I use the same thing. And it's gonna go ahead and build this account for us. And of course we're not gonna watch it create, it's gonna take, you know, 15, 20 minutes, but it's gonna build it, it's gonna put it in that OU, it's gonna apply all those guardrails. If you have any you know, optional pieces of infrastructure that you're orchestrating as well, it's gonna take care of all of that for you as well. The next box where we pick that high level OU, then we can pick any level of nesting, go down as low as you know, five levels down. Simple as that. So now we have a very standardized environment. This was built the same way as App 1, which was built the same way as App 0 and easier to support. And you can see the guardrails are gonna get applied. And 
done. All right. All right, so next we're going to go through, you know, how this all works. And we're going to show you the refactor spaces environment. You know, right now the, the service is in, you know, in, in public uh, preview. And some of the, the mockups may change. So we'll take you through how it looks today. All right, so we're starting out here. We have the users. They're coming in to a static S3 site, and they're going to the original unicorn store, right? So this is our monolith application on the right. Users coming in on the left. And there's a picture of our unicorn store. I'm logging in. I'm going to purchase our favorite unicorn, put it in the cart. It's probably hard to see, but we're showing that it's going straight through to the monolith application. And now we're going to go into refactor spaces and start building out this environment. So first, we have to build a refactor space environment. And this is going to take a little bit of time to build. It's going to build that front door, which we're going to be routing that traffic through. It's going to be pulling through you know, the, the prior API gateway. So I'll show you how this works. I'm going to pick a proxy VPC. Share it with an additional account. And we're going to kick it off. All right, so while that's building, going back to the diagram, right? So now users are still going to come in. They're still going to hit that same endpoint, and they're going to be routed. Remember, this is day one, back to the original unicorn store. So the next thing we need to do, right, so now we need to define two different applications. So you've got basically the monolith and the first microservice. And so we're going to go through in this demo, we're going to break out two different pieces, add to cart and remove from cart, and we're going to show how that works in the end. So first we have to create the monolith because it's going to be routing the default traffic here, calling it legacy. Set the endpoint. And create. So now you see the service that was created in refactor spaces. You can see it matches. We can still log in. Everything works the way it used to work. All right, so now we're passing through. We're going through the new front door, still going back to the monolith, and now we're going to break those two microservices off. Add to cart. We're going to assign it to a lambda. Lambda. I'm going to give it the path. This is going to be a put, I believe. 
post. Yeah, there's a plug. So now we've broken off that service, add to cart. We're going to repeat again for remove from cart. So now you see the traffic is being, it being forked at the uh, transit gateway. Some of the traffic's going through the Lambda, the rest is still going back to the monolith. And this basically repeats itself again, removed from cart. All right, so now we're going back to the unicorn shop. And now we're going to see some of that traffic peeled off into the two microservices. And at the very end, we're going to show how that order went into Dynamo. So we're adding a new one to the shop. Go into Dynamo and see that record. We'll find our glitter unicorn. I'm just going to show in CloudWatch that it was successful. So it's as easy as that. Broke off two microservices. All right. So going forward, we have a couple sessions. If you want to learn more about refactor spaces, there was one that happened yesterday, ENT 321, a workshop, and uh, if you want to learn more about Control Tower, we have a link there. You know, to get started with Refactor Spaces, it's available today. So go to the AWS console. In the Migration Hub, you'll see Refactor Spaces, and you get some more information there. So what we're going to do, we've got a little over 10 minutes left. We're going to take uh, questions off stage uh, over there. So if anybody wants to talk more about this, meet us over there. And uh, thank you.